All right. You said by a very important and intriguing question. <clears throat> Who is your favorite rugby team? That's, that's not the question. Sharks. We'll do the Sharks. Sharks. Let's, let's go. But one of the fundamental differences, one of the fundamental differences between uh, Yusuf and myself, I, I would say, is final authority. Um, we've talked about it before. I am sola scriptura. I go back to the Bible as my sole and final authority. Within Islam, I, I don't find the same, uh, the same attitude of, to the words of the final authority. <clears throat> my opinion now, I see four different kinds of Islam. There's the Islam that you see in Muslim countries that are ruled by Islamic rule. Then there's a different sort of Islam, the cousins of this one, but the Islam you find in non-Muslim uh, countries like this one. I think they're cousins, they're close, but a little different. And then the third group, I'm shy on this one, I'm going to put the name ISIS out there, but only because they use that name. I agree with what you said earlier. I see ISIS more as a political group that is using religion to justify their cause. So, but nonetheless, the name is there. And then this fourth kind of Islam is the one that I view, the one I picture in my mind when I read the Quran. And I read the Quran and I think, okay, that's how Islam should be. But then when I look out into the world, I don't see that same Islam. So then we find in certain countries, there are some practices that are in doubt and so forth. And we have to factor in the Hadith and the Tafsir and different Muslims, a few different things or a table. So I struggle where I sit. I look at the Quran and I think we should just go by the book because that's how I do my faith, just by the book. Once we have to factor in, what about this Hadith and that? That's to me where Islam does that's where the questions come up. Wow, what, where is this violence coming from? How can we justify those practices? So maybe you can, you'll help me, you help all of us understand how, what's the right position, what's the right approach toward the hadith, tafsir, all the other things that you might turn to for answers. Okay. Um, uh, so that's an excellent question, uh, Mike, and I think uh, if I could just have the, I don't think I need the mic itself. <laughs> I'll just use what I've got attached to me. I think the basic thrust of the question asked by my good friend here is that he sees different manifestations of Islam. You see the type of Islam that is practiced in Muslim countries. You see the type of Islam that is practiced in a setting like us, where we have Muslims interacting with non-Muslims. And then of course you see the type of Islam, or if you could call it that, which is practiced by people or groups like ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda, which he quite rightly and I would applaud him for that, acknowledges as something which is inherently political, uh, morphed into something which is mutated. Um, and then of course the fourth aspect, as I understand, is uh, where he questioned um, the, the idea of the Quran in relation to the Hadith. Now, how many of you know what the Hadith are? Well, one, two, three, four, five. The rest of you, six, seven. The rest of you, never heard of the Hadith. Okay. The hadith, basically, I think maybe that's a, that's a starting point. Maybe when I come to part, you could expand on that. The hadith, in, in the time of the prophet, there were things that he would say. Like in the time of Jesus. Jesus would say certain things. It says that Jesus went to a certain place and he preached the gospel. He verbalized certain comments. And so likewise, we find that in the time of the prophet, Muhammad, there were things that he would say. There were things that he would do. There were actions that he would engage in, which was very much um, in sync with 6th century Arabia, for example. And these particular actions, attributes, sayings of him, would be uh, collected orally, and then transmitted from generation to generation. And then in subsequent centuries, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, you'd have people that would basically collate and collect these particular sayings and thereby seem to attribute certain passages or certain aspects of what the prophet said, what he did and what he spoke. It's like this, something like Chinese whispers. You know what Chinese whispers are? So Mike says something to me and then I relate it to him and then I, she, he related to the lady here and then it goes on until we have a whole line of people and then eventually that person records 
what the individual, in fact, narrated, what Mike narrated. I think he's very much like that. And so, in accordance with the science of ID, there is a stringent test or criteria that is utilized in terms of determining what is authentic and what is inauthentic. Now, this has been very loosely done in Islamic history. And more often than not, you find that the hadiths that we have inherited, so-called attributed saints, we say that it's a separate collection. You see this here, these are not the words of Muhammad. Even the stylistic rendering is as if God is speaking. For example, you would tell Muhammad, say, O oh Muhammad, God is one and only. Or, verily, this is part of the revelation, things unseen, which we reveal unto thee, as if God is speaking. But the hadith is what the Prophet allegedly said. And so, there is a separate criteria in determining what is authentic and what is inauthentic. There are a lot of hadiths out there which are inherently inauthentic for the sole reason that they contradict the spirit and the purport of the Quran. And so we would basically reject them. But because the compilers of these particular hadith were viewed with a certain degree of piety, they were viewed as religious holy men, therefore, the, uh, in certain aspects of certain communities, there is a degree of respectability afforded to these particular books. But from an academic, historic point of view, we would analyze these particular sayings and we would contrast them with the Quran. And based on the fact as to whether it conforms to the Quranic text or whether it contradicts with the Quranic text, you either accept it or you do not accept it. So anybody could say the Prophet said this. Well, did he really say that? Is it now in contradiction with what is contained in the Quran? If it is, how then can you accept it? And can you see, Mark, that is essentially the problem. Um, that, that's basically a product of history. It's very much like, um, it, 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 I, I wouldn't say, you see, in the, in, the, in the Gospels, if you look at the Gospels, we as Muslims believe that the Gospel was revealed to Jesus, meaning it's something which God vouchsafed him, gave him revelation. But the Gospels that you have today are biographical accounts about what Jesus did, what Jesus said, and so on. So one could basically argue that just like the Gospel accounts are narratives about what Jesus said and did, the Hadith literature are accounts about what the Prophet did and allegedly said. But there is a test in determining whether that is stringent or not. Now in certain circles, in certain conservative circles, there may be a great degree of emphasis placed on this particular body of literature. But at the end of the day, when it comes to determining, in other words, to separating the wheat from the chaff, you've got the Quran, and I do believe in Sola Scriptura, this is essentially the source. This is source material, the reference book in terms of determining what the Prophet did. And there's a hadith, by the way, where the Prophet stated, do not write down anything about what I said, lest it becomes confused and conflated with the Quran. But certainly in Islamic history, people did do that. And um, through a whole series of oral traditions, you had a person that came, he heard what the Prophet allegedly said, did, and then he compiled it in the form of a book. But that process took centuries later. And so you'd have certain aspects of the Hadith which may not be in accordance with the Quran and would basically reject it. Does that basically clarify your position in terms of the Hadith vis-a-vis -vis the Quran? It, it, it. I understand what you've uh, explained here. I still have some questions about sure. it, but I don't want to take away from their time to ask questions. So maybe we could, I, could I ask a question based on what you said? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, you are now into this field of, uh, you know, you said that you're new into the field of Islamic apologetics and so on. Um, when I've debated some of the people I have debated out there in the world, people like Jay Smith, not so much James White, Jay Smith. Um, there are people like Osama Dakdok, you've seen the debate a few weeks ago, and Robert Spencer, and so on. A lot of these individuals. A lot of them come from the background, which you're very honest about, in terms of which they suggest that they present an image of Christ that is holistically pacifist, which you've clearly corrected. The Mennonites would be one example. Um, who well, I think the Brethren in Christ and many other groups. But it seems to me that there is a trend, and I want you to perhaps address it and correct it, that there is a trend in modern day uh, Christendom, not amongst general Christians, but particularly those Christians who are engaging in polemics against Islam, that when it comes to, for example, the Old Testament, um, the usual retort, as you stated, is, I don't follow Deuteronomy, it doesn't bind me, or uh, Jesus was peaceful, 
the Prophet Muhammad fought wars. Now, is it your position, and, and, and I think this is important to clarify, that when Jesus comes, and when you see the descriptions given in Revelation, for example, about uh, literally coming with a rod of iron and uh, a sword sticking out of his mouth, do you believe that these are metaf metaphors about his return, or do you believe that literally Jesus will come uh, as a, a belligerent judge and enact judgment and literally destroy his enemies? Right. That's okay. It's a very good question. Um, do I get to stand uh, Sure, sure. sure. Right. <laughs> it's not my only. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll read the scripture. I do. I believe what I read. I'm a liter literalist. When I, when I say literalist, please understand a passage where Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I don't believe Jesus is a physical, literal door. I believe it has a real, literal meaning that he is the entranceway to salvation and so forth. So I believe the Bible literally, just to, to set that straight, uh, so that's known. In Revelation 19, I had it correct earlier, verse 11. Uh, he that I, I saw heaven open, behold the white horse, he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. As I mentioned earlier, just to balance it out, 2,000 years of waiting, giving people opportunities to repent. Uh, there's certainly the long-suffering and mercy of God has been manifested. This is not his first option. He doesn't just come and knock people down for not believing. He's trying, he's waiting. But yes, I believe literally, he does come, he judges, he makes war, he does it in righteousness. The people that are going to receive these punishments have earned it. We read this in many other places. In verse number 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He has a name written, and no man knew that he himself, his vestures dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, which you'll find that in the Quran as well. Interestingly enough, this morning, just in my daily devotions, I read the sister passage to that. This is what gave me the idea to ask that. How did you get that from Isaiah earlier? That was well done. I really thought yeah, I'd get you know, that. <laughs> well done. Uh, but in Isaiah chapter 63, who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah, this that is glorious in his apparel, travailing in the greatness of his strength? And then the answer comes. It's like a news reporter. Who is this that's coming from Edom uh, and, and coming with these garments? And he answers, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Jesus answered. Verse 2, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? This is Revelation 16, where he stomps on the enemies and the blood rises up. I, I believe it means what it says. Verse 3, The answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and, all, and of the people there was none with me. So his enemies, of course, did not repent at that time. For I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. This, the, the scripture interprets the scripture. Isaiah 63, it expounds on Revelation 19 and vice versa. I find it very interesting, the next verse. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. So God waits, there's a due time for these judgments, just like it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. God gave mankind warning before bringing down the judgments in Noah's day. Likewise now, not just 120 years, almost 2,000. You know what's interesting about this? A couple chapters before it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, the, uh, the, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Who said that? Who read that in the New Testament? It's Jesus. Jesus read this in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4. It goes on to say, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That is where in Luke chapter 4, Jesus closed the book, handed it back to the rabbi, and walked out. But let me read you the next, the next part of verse 2. And the day of vengeance of our God. That's the next part. It's a comfort all that mourn. As I mentioned earlier, when Jesus came, he came for two things. Number one, deal with the sin issue, suffering servant. If the Jews had accepted, then he would have become the conquering king at that time. This was always part of the plan. This was part of Jesus. It was in his heart because the Jews didn't accept. Now we've entered into this time where we are dealing spiritually with our weapons and so forth. 
But yes, I believe literally he's going to come so, back. So, so could I, could I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I want you I'm to clarify this. I want you to clarify please, this. Please, please. Because I, I want to make sure that you are not a cult. You are, is this mainstream Christian belief? This is mainstream Christian belief. No. This is not mainstream Christian belief. The, the majority of Christians that I meet do not believe the Bible literally. Okay. So how, how would you address people like Jay Smith and so on? How would you, how would you approach them? Um, you know, some the of the same way I, pre- I approach you, you just in love. And I would pull them close, and, and I would say, Jay, I don't agree with you. <laughs> I appreciate that, and I appreciate you. So thank you very much for that. Right, questions thank from Dan. Questions. We, who's, who's coming with the microphone? Yeah, we, we're gonna, the, the, whoever receives the question will have three minutes to answer, and then the other person gets one minute to also so, answer after that. Uh, I'm Yakia, my Christian brother. I will ask you two questions, but they are each other right today. In your Bible, there is where Jesus Christ tells his disciples when they were in Gethsemane. I think it is in the book of Matthew. He said to them, Whoever of you does not have a sword with him today, he must sell his robe and make sure that he got a sword. Am I right? It's so, question. if you say that Jesus Christ did not uh, intend to do violence when he was about to be assassinated, why would he tell his disciples to prepare and get swords for themselves? Because to my belief, swords are used to defend one's life and meaning to kill in order to defend yourself. Correct. So, why are you saying that Jesus Christ did not intend to do any violence whatsoever when he was on earth? That is the first question. It's a good question. Then, the last question would be, during the time of the Crusades, Pope Evan II, he's the man who gathered uh, the Europeans all over Europe to go and attack the Muslims there in, Palestine, uh, in Jerusalem with the aim of capturing uh, uh, Jerusalem. You spoke earlier about ISIL and most of the Christians have got a misconception that we are violent people, of which is not the case. But now, I can put it to you now that since the time of uh, the Crusades, which uh, became the Knight Templars, which now became the Freemasons in this era, they carry on killing the Muslims. They have got organizations like NATO, that is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the U.S. They are the continuation of uh, 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 the Crusades. And there's a proof that some of them even have a bloodline dating back to the time of the Crusades. So I can put it to you that the Muslims are not violent. It is as a result of those people who went to attack the Muslims in those sanctuaries, and which they carry on to do even today. So things like ISIL, Al-Qaeda, and Al-Shabaab, they came as a result of the violence that was perpetrated by the Europeans and the Americans in Muslim countries. I put it to you, I want to hear an answer from you. I, I didn't hear the question in the second thing, uh, but I, I will address the issue. Actually, I already did, didn't I? I, I addressed that very clearly in my opening remarks, that um, there's biblical Christianity, and then there is that false mixture where Constantine started this mixture of the, em- the empire and religion, and I believe he was biblically wrong. I would condemn what Pope Urban did with the Crusades. I think both sides in that war were wrong, to be honest with you. But th- that being said, just because the other guy's wrong doesn't make it right also to react in that way. I believe that the worst atrocities during the Crusades were performed, not by Christians. I would, let's be very careful. They were people calling themselves Christians, yes, but they were Catholics. I believe that's an important distinction. Just as you would make the distinction that ISIS is not Muslim, even though they say they are. So even though somebody claims that title doesn't mean they are, we take out our final authorities and we judge them by that. And and by that standard, I can clearly condemn what happened in the Crusades and any violence that any Christian has done goes against the teachings of the New Testament. To deal with your first uh, question, you were speaking from Luke chapter 22, and uh, Jesus asked them, they, uh, let's get it, verse 36, he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, likewise his script. He that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Well, we, we have to read on further. When Peter takes out his sword and takes off the right ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, Jesus rebukes Peter and tells him to put the sword away. That tells us what that sword was for. It was not for violence. It was not for fighting wars. The sword, there's two possibilities, I believe, that are legitimate, why he tells them to get swords. And bear this in mind, they answered, Lord, we have two swords. He said, it's enough. Are two swords enough to fight a war? 
obviously not. So it, it can't be by the sword so we can go fight and be aggressive in battle. You could make the argument that it's for self-defense, because there's nothing in the New Testament that would uh, stop us from defending ourselves if somebody's trying to physically attack us or take our property. That becomes something of this world that we're allowed to stand up for ourselves. Uh, but the other thing is they can you, you can use a sword for more than war. And, and there are cases all through where you can use it to cut down brushes, you walk places, you can use it to, uh, to slay an animal and eat. There are other uses for the sword. But even if you take the sword as self-defense, I believe that would match best what we're reading here. Because Jesus, when Peter used it to cut off the ear, told him to put the sword away. Okay, yeah. I think I agree in part with most of what he said. I do believe that if the sword was used in the context of self-defense, which I believe initially was in fact the intention of Jesus, there's no problem with that, because he does say that he that had no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now the word for sword in the Greek language, and correct me on this, is makai. Makai was like a sword, like a dagger, uh, like an okapi knife. Do you know what an okapi knife is? That's something what a makai was. And I would argue that the reason that Jesus asked the disciples to take swords is that they were anticipating the Jewish oligarchy coming and taking them when he went to Gethsemane, he, according to my interpretation. He had with him uh, John and James, the so-called sons of thunder. Uh, these were the so-called fighting Irishmen of the day, in a manner of speaking. They were brigands in the initial time. And so he was preparing himself to overtake the Jewish oligarchy that they were anticipating. But what they had done, the Jewish oligarchy had come and they had brought who? They had brought Roman soldiers. And when they brought Roman soldiers, then Peter comes and he cuts off the ear of uh, the, uh, the high priest. Then Jesus says, put down your sword, for he that taketh the sword shall die by the sword. What he basically meant was that in that context, if you were going to continue fighting against trained and Roman soldiers of that time, his disciples were falling asleep when he was praying in Gethsemane. They would have been totally exterminated. So in that context, I believe that the strategy changed. But I do believe from my reading of the New Testament that the intention initially of Jesus was in fact to bring swords of self-defense. I don't believe the swords are spiritual, but I have no problem with that. I have absolutely no problem with that. And people like Thomas Aquinas and so on, even John Calvin, have used that in passages like that in order to justify just war theory, which I have no problem with it fundamentally. So, in respect of Luke 22, when the swords were being used or called, I do believe that Jesus and his disciples were anticipating the Jewish uh, oligarchy coming uh, and trying to take them, and they had come with Roman sword. So, accordingly, the strategy must change. But well, that's my interpretation of the scripture. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matisse Musiali. I'm with the... Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm with the Baptist Church in Poetry Street. I read something interesting on the internet uh, that's written also in the Quran. The start of 4, I, uh, 50. It's interesting that you're an advocate, someone who believes uh, in the Constitution. And let me just read what the, the star says, Quran says here. So it's Surah 4, Ayah? 15. 15? Yes. I thought you said 50. It says, those who commit immorality, that is, unlawful sexual intercourse of your woman, bring against them four witnesses from among you. Now, as an advocate, how would you approach, or rather, how would you allow a Muslim woman to, who has been under such atrocity to get justice from it. Okay. Basically, the, and I think just to quote the entire verses, it says, Surah 4 verse 15, and as for those of your women who are guilty of, or an allegation is made of indecency, fornication, or immorality, then bring four witnesses from amongst you to testify. Now, in this particular context, what the Quran is anticipating is four eyewitnesses to an act of immorality. So it's not just simply 
as in, for example, rape cases in South Africa. In South Africa, individuals can be acquitted of rape based simply on circumstantial evidence if the state hasn't proven its case beyond reasonable doubt. In Islam, on the other hand, if an allegation is made of immorality against a woman, you have to bring four eyewitnesses that testified that they actually saw the act. And if under cross-examination, if under cross-examination, any of those eyewitnesses contradict, then according to the juristic, the jurisprudence, according to the classic jurisprudence, if any of those four eyewitnesses contradict each other on their testimony, all four eyewitnesses receive, according to the jurisprudence, 80 lashes or 80 flogs. So that would basically mean that for anyone to come and make an allegation uh, or testify that a woman is in fact immoral or has committed adultery or fornication, then that person has to back it up with four eyewitnesses, which is clearly an impossible situation. And even the testimony, even one under cross-examination bears false witness, all four are in fact punished according to Islamic law. And that is far more superior because it means then that you cannot just come and willy-nilly make an allegation of chastity or immorality against women because this was a common Arab practice. In ancient Arabian society, people were just simply accused, allegations were made, and that would be a means in terms of which they would be basically accused of fornication, accused of adultery, and a whole lot of aspects, and they were subsequently punished. But the Quran changed that rule, and it changed that rule, and it made it so stringent that it made it a well-known impossibility for people to make allegations of slander or immorality against another person. The other point I need to make mention is that the issue of stoning, you know, we have the aspect of stoning for adulterers. Stoning is a biblical practice. Do you know in the Quran, there is absolutely nothing that says that you should stone the adulterers? Absolutely nothing. Maybe pastor can in fact expand on it in his time. There's absolutely nothing on that particular point. Yet, that is a biblical law. And in fact, in Surah Nur, it speaks about the adulterer and the adulteress, both male and female. So it's not just a question of questioning the chastity of a female. It's a question of questioning the chastity of a male. Both male and female. It takes two to tangle, not just one. And so from that perspective, I would argue, how do I reconcile it? Well, in fact, the standard is far more stringent. So you cannot just simply come, make false allegation, and bear false testimony against women. That, in fact, goes to show that the status and the integrity of a woman is protected to such an extent that if one person falsely testifies, all of them are going to be basically punished. I don't have a lot more to add on that because this is a question strictly from the Quran. I believe he's given a very satisfactory answer on this. I will slip in something from the Bible because that's what I do. Um, th this, is, this is akin to the story in John chapter 8 of the woman taken in adultery. And the reason that Jesus was able to have mercy on her, the Jewish elders were trying to pull a fast one. They said, we caught the woman in the act of adultery. Now what do you say we do? Well, if you've caught her in the act of adultery, then the law in Deuteronomy and Leviticus says both the adulterer and the adulteress need to die. If you caught her in the act, where's that other guy? Why'd you let him go? So this ties back in in Deuteronomy in the book of Numbers. You find it a couple times. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. The Quran in this instant takes it one step further and says you've got to have four witnesses. Um, so I don't know, maybe you guys learned it from us and just tried to go a little more. <laughs> but I, I have no issues with what he's explained. This gentleman there, that gentleman. Okay, we'll come to you. Him, you. Okay. You go to him next. Hi, uh, Yusuf. Uh, Maybe I want to hear this one more time. Because uh, way back, well, that was right after the end of World War, I believe, when I was in grade four. Uh, that's a long, long time ago, as you can see. Uh, I, I sat in the history class, and I remember we were, that was my first, by the way, that was the first time I went to a, a mosque. And we had teachings about uh, uh, the Muslim culture, and they said, and one thing I, I remember, and this is what I want to I want to hear just one more time. They said, uh, the teacher said that one of the cornerstone doctrines 
of the Muslim culture is to extend their territory by means of holy wars, the jihad that you discussed earlier. So, what I understand here tonight, that is not true. Mm. Not true. Not true. What is this? Yes. The answer is it's not true. It's not true. That's not true. Okay. And I think I've given you verses in the Quran which speak about. I believe you. Yeah, and I think Pastor Mike agrees with me as well. But I may add one thing, just to clarify this, that Muslim armies in history have in fact engaged in expansion. They have in fact engaged in expansion, just like the Christians engage in expansions and acquisition of land um, and expansion of territory. But I may add this, that more often than not, it became convenient for them to cite religion or religious justification for their particular actions. For example, uh, when Pope Urban II gave a commandment to the commanders to liberate Jerusalem, he cited Luke 19, 27. Those enemies of mine that would not reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me. And so, Pastor Mike would obviously argue that that's a parable or probably a future allusion to Christ and his second return. But people have used religion to expand their territory. Um, and, and I think it's also, it, it's, 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 a, it's a disservice to history because the world we're living in is very much different to the world seven, eight hundred years. There, were, there, was no, there was no territory as such. There was no, you know, your country uh, is um, South Africa and then there's Zimbabwe. There were empires. There were empires fighting against empires. You had the Byzantine Christian Empire. Then you had the Islamic Empire. Then you had the Ottoman Empire. Then the Abbasids. Then the Chinese Empire. These were empires competing against each other. So to suggest or to try and superimpose that particular um, social political milieu in the 21st century does basically a disservice to history. So we'd see that as products of history, but there's nothing in the Quran which today informs us to go take the sword or take the gun and kill people and then take over their land. There's absolutely nothing for that, and the Quran is quite clear on that point. <laughs> Uh, I think he wants to speak. you want to make a comment? Yes, sure. I'm sorry, I'll go quickly. Um, this is actually what I mentioned earlier, that there are still questions I have about Islam and the Quran, and, and this is actually one of them. I'm reading from Surah 8, verse 38 and 39. Say to the unbelievers, if now they desist from unbelief, their past would be forgiven them. But if they persist, the punishment of those before them is already a matter of warning for them, meaning past Vic, uh, past wars that were fought and won by the Muslims, that should have taught these unbelievers better. Verse 39, and fight them on until there is no more tumult or oppression and there prevail justice and faith in God altogether and everywhere. But if they, dis if they cease, verily God doth see all that they do. So I'm not, I'm not going to take the path of the typical Christian polemicist on this point, but I will say that the, what, what they... What they say is, see, it says fight until everybody has faith in Allah, which makes it sound like let's proselytize by the sword. I don't think that's what it's saying. Clearly, from the context, it's, it's a, there's a war happening, somebody attacked them. If the enemy ceases, then no more fighting. I get that. My, my concern, though, is the limits of this. And that's why I mentioned earlier, with Israel, God gave them a piece of land and said, now here's the rules for your land. There was no idea of expansion or move. God put limits on it. And with Islam, I don't read anything in the Quran where God said uh, to Muhammad or any of them, that's your land, these are the rules that you govern your land by. So anybody that comes, a war proceeds, and then where does it stop? Because this verse says all together and everywhere. So even though it might be a defensive war, I believe it is in this passage, I don't see the boundaries for it, which is one of my concerns uh, that I still have about Islam and the Quran. Could I address that? Do you, you want me to address no. that? No. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to address that? Um, that's it's up to you. That's up to them. Okay, that's up to them. Do you want me to address it? He's asked to. Uh, it's up to you. It's up to obviously up to you. Do you want me to address what he raised? I think the question that passed. <laughs> Thirty seconds. The question that he's basically asked is that he sees no limitations in terms of what you have here. Absolutely no limitations in terms of the actual principle of fighting. But I did mention, and I mentioned it numerous times. Limitations for the land. Limitations for the land. But, but, but here's the problem. In Surah 60, if you look at Surah 60, because you need to judge the pose then. Maybe you could read it for us so we could do this together. If you open the Surah 60, maybe this, uh, this will be far more quicker. We can't do the Roman numerals. Uh, that in Surah 60, verse 8, 
it gives a limitation. It gives a limitation to you in terms of engaging in hostilities with those who are fighting. And what's the limitation? It says here, Allah forbids you not from respecting those who fight you not for your religion, nor drive you forth from your homes, that you show them kindness and deal with them justly. Allah only forbids you from respecting those who fight you for your religion and drive you forth for your home and help in your expulsion that you make friends of them. And whoever makes friends of them, they are the wrongdoers. There's a limitation. Can you see? That's where the limitation is. The limitation is that if you meet a community from another religious group that engages in fighting for you and wants to fight you and drive you out from your home, you fight against them. But it says here, if they do not fight against you, they do not fight against your faith, they do not drive you forth from your homes, then there's no prohibition. In fact, it is no, it's, a permiss it's in fact an obligation that you show them kindness and deal with them justly. That would be the limitation. But you'd have to juxtapose it with the other passages in the Quran and read it holistically to come to the conclusion. Does that, does that basically make sense? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. The, 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 my question was about the land. Okay. I, but I, I understand your point there. So let's sure. go to the next one. This one wants to give a question as well. Pastor Mike, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This many peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of us. And my question I would like to address to Pastor Mike. As you know, from your understanding of the Islamic knowledge of Islam, that uh, Islam, even the Greek mystery, it, uh, is about peace. And also, uh, Brother Yusuf Ismail always quoted from the Quran 67 verses encouraging peace. From your understanding and where you come from, don't you think this is the, the plan of the enemies of Islam to want to tarnish the beauty name of Islam? In the likeness of ISIS, when uh, we know what America did to Iraq, and now in Syria, and now NATO in, in Libya, and then they are creating these groups so that they may, they may tarnish the beautiful name of Islam, according to Islam. Yes, yes, I, I believe that uh, it works both ways. I believe that down through the ages, there have been many times people have used a name, whether it's Christianity or Islam, in, 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 improperly and they've done atrocities, and then it tarnishes the name. I, I admit that. I think it happens both ways. I think that is what ISIS is doing. I, I think they're making Islam look bad. Now, that being said, I'll also be quick to point out, I, I do not believe the Quran is inherently violent. I don't think it teaches somebody to go out and do what ISIS does. I, that's my understanding of the Quran. Um, I believe Islam is a different subject. And that's why I mentioned earlier, I see different versions of Islam. So depending on which hadith they count as sahih and so forth, then it gets a bit confusing, a bit dodgy in there. But then in, in Christianity, so-called, we have that issue too, where people take the Bible, take certain church fathers, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and then they twist that and justify wrongdoing and wickedness. So I think both of us have to deal with that to a certain extent. Yeah. Thank you. I think that I, I agree with him entirely. We both agree. I agree with this point. Next uh, my question is a question brother. It's very short and concise. But I wish and I want that you will answer it comprehensively okay. and in very clear terms. Do not make an argumentation. I want you to be very clear on that point. From the beginning. You have said that you believe that Jesus was God. And you will agree with me that Jesus was born at a certain time, some two thousand years ago. Yes. So now like, and, and we know that as a matter of fact that this universe on which, or this planet on which we live, it does exist just for two years, two thousand years. So the question is, before the birth, the miracle birth, and I would believe as a true Muslim, the miracle birth of Jesus, who was God before the miracle birth of Jesus? I want you to answer that comprehensively in a clear cut answer. Thank you. I do not believe that we can limit Jesus as God to his human existence. I don't, that, that would be unfair. So John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
which that verse can only be understood in the Trinitarian sense. The same was in the beginning with God. Moving to the end of our to verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So I believe that God has always existed. I believe He is a Trinity. But then His human manifestation happened 2,000 years ago. So I, I do not want to limit God to saying He only has one manifestation, and that is His spiritual form. I think that would be wrong to limit God. With God, all things are possible. So if God wants to manifest Himself in human form, He's well able to do that. I believe both of us have in our scriptures, Muslim and Christian alike, that with God, all things are possible. So I would certainly not put that beyond God's ability to manifest himself in, in human form. Amen. Now, if we were to say that God was doing something sinful or wrong, that's beyond God, isn't it? The limits of God are his holiness. He'll never do anything sinful or wrong. But to humble himself, take on the form of a human being, that's not contradictory to the nature of or the morality or any of that of God. That's just him choosing to manifest himself in a different way at a different time. And furthermore, God is omnipresent. He's able to be in more than one place at one time. I think everybody in the room would agree with that. And therefore, it would be easy for God to be in heaven and another part of God to be on the earth at the same time, manifested in a different way. So I hope that's comprehensive enough. Okay, I think that's another topic entirely, but just to make a quick observation, that's something which we disagree with. I may, however, quote Job chapter 25, verse 4. Maybe Pastor could deal with it. It does say in Job 25, verse 4, and here I'm preaching, How then can man be justified with God? How can man be justified with God? Or how can he, this is what Job says, How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Ye, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a maggot, and the son of man who is a woman. Now, when you look at the distinction that is created, the son of man, slightly of a higher degree, man, which is a maggot, clearly there is a distinction being basically made. That's an entire debate on its own. We've never tackled this debate. We may do it in the future. Suffice to state that from a Muslim perspective, we would believe that Jesus is a man. He's a human being. He was a mighty messenger of God. If you look at John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Greek, and Pastor, could, but he, I, he could come back and address as well. In Greek, en arche, en ho logos, kai ho logos, en pros, ton theon, kai theos, en ho logos. In other words, there's a distinction there between, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, ton theon, and the Word was with theos. Therefore, the Unitarians and people like Dale Tuggy, and even the Jehovah's Witnesses, choose to translate the second God with a small g based on the fact that the Logos had that divine quality amongst him, but the Logos was not almighty God. That's my reading and my interpretation of the text. But again, it's another debate on its own. If Pastor wants to come back on that, that's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. We'll deal with that in the future, hopefully. Thank you. Good evening to all. Two questions to Pastor Mike. He's got more friends than me tonight. Huh? <laughs> okay, uh, firstly, as you mentioned, that uh, you see so, uh, four sort of four versions of Islam, and the Islam that you read about in the Quran is actually what Islam is supposed to be. I, I so, would think so. Uh, in the same way, I can ask that the Christian, the Christianity that you read about in the Bible, is it the same religion that you see in the world today? Excellent question. Secondly, um, <laughs> uh, uh, regarding the Quran, uh, if you, I'm sure you already looked at it, the Quran uh, may differ in the way it is translated and the way commentaries are made upon it from place to place. But uh, if you look at the text, it is exactly the same from cover to cover all over the world. Why is it that the Bible is of many versions and different in words and etc. Okay. All right. Remind me. Your first question. You said that I. I oh, that's it. I. I made mention that when I read the Quran, I don't see Islam mirror, mirroring what I put there. And yes, he's pointed out very, very aptly, very correctly. Um, you visit my church on any given Sunday, you'll hear me pointing this out constantly. Right, folks? Amen. <laughs> okay. There's a few amens there because they know I'm preaching. Um, yeah. James chapter 1, verse 22. Don't deceive yourselves. Don't only be hearers. Be doers of the word. We're constantly preaching that. I, I think that's a common problem for both of us, isn't it? Is that we find people not living up to the standard, which is why we need a Savior. But um, 
it, it is an issue. It is an issue. I, I am attempting to live my life by the Bible. I am. And I find that the more effort I put into that, the more I conform to what the Bible says and what to the image of Jesus Christ, the more joy I have, the more fellowship I have with the Father, the better I get along with my brothers and sisters in Christ, the more I'm able to love you, sir. Even you, sir. <laughs> wow. What an amazing God we have. <laughs> All right, now to your second question, uh, the manuscript thing. Uh, there, there have been. Uh, this is something Yusuf and I, we've chatted about this in the past. When it comes down to the manuscripts, uh, the Bible has a lot more manuscript evidence behind it than the Quran. You can find some variations even within the Quranic manuscripts. Not nearly what you find with the Bibles. I think that has to do with the amount of manuscripts. Plus, the differences you find in the Quranic material is not nearly like what you would find with the Bible. That being said, that is a large topic we're just not able to dig into too deep. A lot of the differences you find between the Bibles, it does come down to how they translate words. It also comes down to which Greek or Hebrew manuscripts they're working from. And that is why me personally, I, I stick to the King James Bible in English based on its purity. I realize that others, you can translate Greek words different ways and maybe come out with a different translation, still be right. But uh, these newer versions of the Bible, they tend to lean on manuscripts recently found, and they might be older. I don't consider them better. And there's where the variants come in, and, and that's why I do stick to this, because it seems to be complete and whole and pure. It doesn't contain contradictions as I see it. So I, I, I hope that's a bit of an answer to you. I, I wish I could dig deeper, but for three minutes. Okay, that's fine. Next question. Hi, this is Jonathan, uh, Mr. Yusuf. I just want to ask, it's actually a concern. I, I know a lot of uh, Muslims and I respect you because you are so calm and nice people. And I was in Jeddah for, for two years and I met up with the most beautiful people and Muslim people. But my concern is, there's about 1.8, you, you said there's 1.8 million, billion Muslims all around the world. And then you had the, the you said there was a Chinese whisper of some people that will go radical. Now, if there's 2% in the world that's radical, that, that leaves us about 4 million, or say 2 million, radical Muslims, uh, Muslims uh, or ISIS, or what you want to call them. And they, uh, now that's an army. And that's our concern. It's not the, it's not the, 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 the Muslim and that we see and that we respect. But there's a concern that there's four million people. That's my concern. Can you please address that? Okay. Please. I don't know how the Chinese whispers, the Chinese whispers were discussing the context of the Hadith and the Ifna. I don't know how that ties up with the issue of, uh, of, uh, of the, the militancy that you see in the world today. You may have conflated the two. No, sorry, um, maybe I, I said it wrong. Remember that, guys, that, that goes out in the yeah. name of ISIS and say, okay, certain things they take up wrong. Yeah. And now, and now they, sorry. Uh, certain things that they say, that you were, taught, uh, that you were uh, saying about the Quran, mm -hmm. that some of them, they take it up wrong. No, that, say that's 1% of all the Muslims, and they take it up wrong. That's the whole army. That's what I was actually referring to. Yeah, okay, look, I, I, would, I would say that the statistics are not, I don't believe that there are 4 million extremists in the world today. There may be people who are ultra-conservatives, but if you're talking about the capacity of people like ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda, they are not as many as up to 4 or 5 million. The other point is this, is that a lot of them don't engage in what I would call atomized reading of scripture. Because if you look at the examples that are presented in my lecture, most of the people who analyze them and study these individuals and in fact interview them and look at their background, you basically find that with most of these people it's a question of religious identity. When Didier Francois was kept in captivity with ISIS, a lot of the people that he met had absolutely no interaction with their faith. They didn't have a copy of the Quran. And so a lot of these youngsters that go, you've seen the pictures that I've shown you. A lot of them are not, they're not religiously motivated individuals. Now they may be. There may be some individuals who perhaps hold a leadership position that may choose to atomize the scripture. Their number is even, even more smaller because you've got them a few hundred at the most. 
leaders who basically are so-called self-appointed clerics, um, people like Osama bin Laden. He was not even a religious scholar, do you know that? Osama bin Laden was not a religious scholar, yet many people view him as a religious scholar. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, nobody knows his background. He just simply appeared in, 1970, um, uh, in 2003 after the Iraqi invasion, and these people just simply pop up. What is quite fascinating is that all these individuals arise after aggressive, militant, imperial invasion. Why is that the case? Like, for example, in Cambodia. Cambodia was a peaceful land. Yet, uh, under uh, President Nixon and his Secretary General Henry Kissinger, they bombed Cambodia into the Stone Age. What happened? You had the rise of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge that committed atrocities that equate, if not worse, than what ISIS is doing. Iraq. Iraq had absolutely no religious fundamentalist militant problem in the 80s, 70s, and the 60s. It was a secular dictatorship. After the 2003 invasion, what happens? It suddenly becomes a total catastrophe, a total anarchy. So I think we need to look at the situation. Is it also not just simply the question of the concern, but the, the problems that imperial power is basically engaging in? What you have, the, power, the powerful hegemonic uh, right-wing extremist regimes, the United States government and its wars that it's been committing in many countries, foreign policy issues, a whole lot of factors that basically play to this. So to simply state that this is a problem, one thing which you and I can do is let's not empower the extremists. How do we not empower them? We do not empower them by calling them back to an authentic version of Islam. If you call them back to an authentic version of the Quran, then you immediately disempower them. It delegitimizes them entirely. And that's basically the role which we as Muslims should do. And of course, like-minded Christians, like yourself, like the good uh, people in the audience, like my good friend Pastor Mike, and of course, do away with the kind of aberrations and the mutations that have basically crept into our faith. All right, I think, speaking from the Christian point of view, we've already set an example for how to deal with this in our church history. Because as I mentioned earlier, I didn't have time to elaborate very much on it, but when you get Constantine uh, in the 300s and moving forward, and you have this church state set up within the Roman Catholic Church and so forth, after about a thousand years of that, a lot of Christians got sick of it. And said, we are tired of people blaming Christianity for all these horrible atrocities. And then John Wycliffe stood up and said, hey, it's time that the people started reading the Bible in their own language. No more priests preaching, preaching to us in Latin that we don't even understand. They said, we want our Bible in English. Wycliffe translated it. It completely revolutionized uh, not only that country, but the world eventually. It led to the Reformation, to people getting back to the book. Now... You might be thinking, I'm saying, well, if that's the case, then Islam needs to be out there preaching and telling these right-wing groups, come back to the Quran. Yusuf, I love you, but you know what you should do? Tell them to come back to the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there, is there one question there? But the teaching, and I don't know how widespread it is, but the teaching is that the one sure way to get into heaven is to engage in violent jihad. And so it seems like uh, what, what a lot of them are doing is saying, okay, well, I've done a lot, a lot of bad deeds, so if I die now, I'm screwed. Therefore, I better go and engage in jihad, because that, 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 that's like a desperate way of me trying to get to heaven. So, so it seems to be what's happening. If I, if I, if I um, so I, I do agree with you that I don't think um, so the teaching violence, but it does seem to be a product of the system in a way. Uh, I don't know what to use on. Yeah, you know, that, that would mean looking, I think what the question is basically saying is that these people have basically lived a sinful life all their lives, and then suddenly they're engaging in a form of violent jihad as a kind of a redemption for their past sins. Now, that would mean going directly and deeply and delving into the internal motivations of the individual. And it becomes inherently problematic because when you look at these individuals that are subsequently either arrested prior or subsequent or before a terrorist act is in fact committed, they don't cite that as a justification for their particular acts of violence. So if they cited that, maybe they may have had this warped idea or notion that, look, I'm going to commit the act of violence and therefore it's going to get me a straight ticket to heaven. They don't cite this. There may be some that may possibly believe in this. I don't know. I haven't opened up their hearts and looked at their internal motivations. But more often than not, you cite and you see a case of dissatisfaction, 
uh, a case of a loss of identity, and they may use Islamic terminology to justify the acts of violence. But I don't think looking at these individuals, like for example Salman Abidi, uh, the Manchester bomber, or uh, Muhammad Abta, the 9-11 uh, uh, attacker, who was purportedly found in strip clubs and so on. I don't think they believe that now, uh, this, this, is, this is basically a straight ticket for us to go to heaven because of our past sins. What it basically shows, for me, is that these individuals are not particularly knowledgeable about their specific faith. And that's what an analysis by psychologists, by people like Mark Stegman, have gone on to show. That a true knowledge of your faith could never lead you to the kind of insanity that you basically see. Because there's absolutely nothing. If there was any form of scriptural justification for that, you know, the Quran does in fact speak about martyrdom and the rewards of a martyr. But there is absolutely no scriptural justification for the idea in the Quran or in the prophetic tradition that for you to cleanse yourself of your sins, you now need to go and take a machine gun and just shoot down anyone. It's totally insane. It's totally warped. It's totally perverted. And it's totally, uh, it, it's basically some sort of, people may, right-wingers by the way, may promote that idea. I'm talking about the extreme right from the West may want to promote that idea. But they will do it for their own particular agenda. But there's no scriptural basis or justification from that, from the Quranic point of view. All right, I'm going to respond just real quick. This is, it actually ties into why I asked about the Hadith, okay. to, to be honest with you. Um, it, let, let me see if I can put a, a nasty spin on this. All right. There's a Hadith, help me, in case I get it wrong, where Muhammad said that the entrance of paradise is underneath the shadow of the swords. Right? Okay, and then I turn to Surah 9, verse 20. Those who believe and suffer exile and strive with might and main... Do your best to fight. In God's cause, with their goods and their persons, have the highest rank in the sight of God. They are the people who will achieve salvation. So, I, I, I hear a hadith that says, if I want to get to paradise, i got to pass through this sword, under the shadow of the swords. Then I flip open my Quran, or I listen to some radical imam that's all hyped up on jihad and so forth, and he gives me just this verse, and says, you see, the highest rank what can achieve you salvation, according to that verse, is to strive with, your, with all your might. Now, if I left it there, I believe you would see where some people get the motivation to say, okay, I get it. Hadith says, swords, paradise, this is highest rank. Uh, that's how, and it says, they will achieve salvation. I put that together. If I don't have an imam or a Yusuf, they're whispering over my shoulder saying, no, don't understand it like that. I might be in trouble. So that's why I asked but about the Hadith. Yeah, please respond. I think, I think the point, just, just open it. Okay, oh, sorry. And I think the point, the point he was asking, the point he was asking, which is something subsequently different from what's contained in the Quranic verse. Both from the Christian and the Muslim perspective, we have a high regard for martyrs. Do we agree? This is true. In Christianity, there's a high regard for martyrs. In Islam, also, there's a high regard for martyrs. So, as it says, those who believe and suffer exile, they suffer exile. How do you suffer exile? You suffer exile by going to a strip club, by basically engaging in alcoholic consumption, engaging in drug taking, visiting prostitutes. So it cannot basically refer to people who are engaging in the vices, the worst vices of society, and then kill people, and then basically believe they're going to heaven. So it says here categorically, those who believe, so those people who are not really believing if they're engaging in vices, and then it says suffer exile. You can't suffer exile by visiting hookers and taking drugs and drinking alcohol and strive with might and may in that context in God's cause would their goods and their persons have the highest rank in the sight of God there are people who achieve salvation and we have no, there, there's no apology we make for this that martyrdom, a person who suffers and strives in the might in the path of God in any way physically, um, psychologically, emotionally will have the highest sight in the God and if he's killed in that process and martyred he basically has the highest rank in paradise. But nowhere can you see in this verse any form of justification. And, and I just read it exactly what you read. Yeah. Can you see any justification that a person now believes, based on reading this verse, that I can go tomorrow, go to a strip club, drink alcohol, take drugs, and then I go and shoot a whole lot of people in the shebang, and somehow I'm getting a free ticket to heaven. You can't reach that conclusion based on reading this particular verse. I do believe the fact that martyrdom has a high position in Islam. Martyrdom also has a high position in Christianity. And so that should not be confused by people who engage in acts of violence 
and one of them being quoted with martyrs. That's where the distinction should be made. Let, uh, to, let, yeah, let me jump back in, because remember what I said when I started to explain this. I told you up front, I'm going to put a nasty spin on it, right? I told you that, because I'm aware of how the verses get abused. You know why? For t almost 2,000 years, people have been doing it to the Christian Bible as well. So I get it that people do it to the Quran. That's not fair. Equal scales. So that's why I told you, nasty spin. Martyrdom, uh, we do. We hold in high esteem. There is a slight difference. Uh, it, with, within Islam, they go out and fight these battles. Justifiable, if, if, if even so. But then somebody dies in this physical battle. Whereas with the Christian, we consider martyrdom somebody who is uh, out there preaching the gospel and gets persecuted for it. He is, is not engaged in violence. But that being said, I still agree we hold them both in high esteem. So. The Calvinists may disagree with you. And, and that's fine. We'll debate them next. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm supposed to be a chairman, but Pastor, uh, even in Islam, if a person stands for justice, all he has to do is agree with the tyrants and he, he will be accepted. And if he disagrees on a just matter and he's persecuted and killed, he's a martyr. I, I didn't understand. I think what he's saying, what he's saying is, he said, he said, you've got the just war theory in Islam, where a person, for example, fights in a just war, a defense of one in the Quran, and he's killed. That's a martyr. But at the same time, you've got a person, for example, in a solitary sense, stands up and challenges, for example, unjust laws, or speaks truth to an oppressive leader, and therefore is persecuted, imprisoned, tortured to death, that's also a martyr. No, no, so yes, so, so, so martyrdom yeah. is basically all-inclusive. Uh, it it deals with fighting in, in battle, in a legitimate battle, not just any belligerent battle, and of course dying uh, in, 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 in the normal pacifist context of the world. I, I understand. What, what yeah. you were explaining was one form of martyrdom. Yeah, I, one, I just wanted so, to point out. So, so, so Islam incorporates two forms of martyrdom. I would argue that Pastor Mike and his interpretation will incorporate one form of martyrdom. The Lutherans and the Calvinists Difference. they have a different uh, interpretation as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the last question. Good evening, Pastor. I want to introduce you to all the guests. Uh, I think, first of all, the current situation that we experience, just a little comment before I actually start the comment, and I'd like to just say something to the question of the gentleman. Question of the gentleman there. The current situation needs to be understood within context of, or within its historical context, and the ignorance that Brother Yusuf has uh, made reference to when he spoke about the people that are exploited for the agenda of those who wish to fight certain wars needs to be understood. And we need to ask why are those people actually ignorant of their religion? And I think the answer to that finds itself in the removal of people from their religion because of historical, political reasons, colonization, and what, what went with it. So we find people that have been removed from their culture, removed from their religion, transplanted within a, another culture, and they've been stripped of their identity. They, they try to find roads back to their culture and they're unfortunate to fall into the hands of people that exploit them and that is quite often what is happening in the, in the West. Uh, the only way to counter that is like you people uh, referred to before and that is to spread the good positive interpretation of Islam. Uh, what I would like to say with regards to the gentleman's question, if you allow me to Jihad is sacred, and we have the Crusades. I know you deny the legitimacy of the Crusade, but it's, it's a part of Christianity. And Jihad is a part of Islam, definitely, and we don't deny that. But what happened is Muslims went to preach, and they requested, they went and sought permission from the authorities to convey the message. If they were denied, access to convey the message, they went in and did. So they first sought permission to convey the message. When they were denied to convey the message, denied permission to convey, they went out onto the land and started conveying the message. If they were prohibited, obviously forcefully, they then retaliated with force. And that was how jihad was fought in initially. What we see now is no form of jihad. Uh, I've got two questions. The first is with regards to the Gospel of the Bible. 
It's a fact of history that Christianity was used by the Roman Empire to further certain agendas. Okay. It's a fact that the gospel, the text of the gospel was manipulated to suit certain agendas. Question is, where is the original text of the Bible? Two is, the current text that we have, which is referred to as the Bible, is recollections as what was referred to almost compared to the Hadith. And that is what we see the Bible with being today. Uh, a lot of meaning was also lost in its translation from Hebrew to Latin, and from Latin to the various languages that we use today. So I'd like, I know you, you made mention of you preferring to use a certain uh, Bible or a version of the Bible for certain reasons. And that goes back to, to a word you used where you said, it seems to, to be, to you, the most authoritative uh, copy of the Bible today. And that is, that is a problem for me because it goes back to the opinion of a, of a person as to what is authoritative and not. And it will always be challenged, and definitely is challenged in, in the Christian, larger Christian religion. The second question that I'd like to pose is that we see a clear chain of prophets from the creation of Adam. And we all believe that the we, this is something common between the three faiths of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, that we all believe in the prophets, starting from, from Adam. <coughs> and Enoch, and up and up and up, until we have Abraham, the children of Abraham. The, the Jews believe until Moses and deny the, the, the prophethood, prophethood of, of Jesus. The Christians, on the other hand, accept Jesus and deny the prophethood of Muhammad. Why is it that we agreed on everything before, but we haven't agreed on the finality of Muhammad? If we look at the two religions and how close they are in many aspects, we can see how they overlap on another. Yet, the only th there's two things that differentiate a Muslim from, from a Christian in, in essence. And that is, the first is that Jesus is regarded as the son of God, not just the prophet. We, we, regard, we accept Jesus as being a prophet. We speak of Mary. There's a whole chapter dedicated to, to, to Mary. But the finality of prophethood of Muhammad is, is, is denied by Christians. And the second thing, uh, I think, I think just to, just to be fair to the pastor, I think you you got the questions. Um, yeah, I think basically the issues are the aspect of the gospels. That would be the last question, as I understand. Okay. All right. I I had a quote from Shabir Ali to this extent, where he mentioned that both Islam and Christianity, we don't have access to the original manuscripts for either of our books. Um, so you have to judge the matter based on what we do have left. And when, it, when I mentioned earlier, and I did, that it seems to me the King James Version is the most reliable and authoritative version. I am convinced of that, not because I just like it, but I have studied it and compared it with the others. Um, and th thank you for the segue, another advertisement. Be sure to grab one of those books over yonder that we brought. Uh, that was the purpose of that book, actually, is to show why we rely on the Bible, why I don't see contradictions in it, even though it, that many have been supposed and brought up. Um, so I admit, you, to answer your first question, where are the original biblical manuscripts? We don't have them. But think of this, folks. How would you know you found them if you found them? Do you think Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, any of them wrote the epistle and stamped on it original? We, we would, even if you found it, you wouldn't know you found it. So God never promised in the Bible that he would preserve the original manuscripts. What he did promise is that he would preserve his words and preserve his knowledge. And I believe he can do that in any language he so desires. Uh, so that, I believe that addresses the first one. The second one, why do we not accept uh, Muhammad and his prophethood as a continuation? Uh, that's actually a lengthy answer, but I'll, I'll try to condense it and just say this. I don't see Muhammad as confirming what came before. So what I read with Moses, Jesus, the other prophets, when I read the Bible, I don't see it consistent with what we read in the Quran. So certain things that Muhammad said contradict what we find in the Bible. My personal opinion of this is when he wrote the Quran, or when, when, he, when he recited the Quran, let's say it like that, it's truthful, uh, 
he was not aware that he was contradicting the Bible. He thought everything lined up. But then years later, when people begin to investigate, oh my goodness, it doesn't line up. And then this teaching of, oh, the Bible must be corrupted because Muhammad can't be wrong. And I, I think that crept in a little later. But that's why I don't, one of the reasons I don't take Muhammad as the continuation of those prophets. I just don't see him being consistent with what came before him. Thank you, it's a good question. I'm not going to delve into the issue of scriptural things. That, that's a debate in itself. Um, I would like to address it uh, at some later stage. Just quickly on the point. In the Quran, in Surah 61, verse 6, you read the passage, and when Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, surely I am the messenger of God, to you verifying that which is before me of the Torah, and giving good news of a messenger who will come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. And that's contained in the Quran. There was a future prophecy about Jesus, about a man who is a praised one. Now, do we find something like this in the, in the New Testament? Some scholars argue that if you look at John chapter 16, verse 12 to 14, regarding the spirit of truth, basically you hear the expression where Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Meaning, God had given God, Jesus guidance to guide mankind till doomsday, but the people were not fit to receive the message. So he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, when he, the spirit of truth shall come, he will guide you unto all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things ever shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare the, unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify me. And John uses the term spirit and prophet interchangeably, because if you look at 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Beloved believers, not every spirit, because many false prof prophets have gone out into the world. In other words, a true spirit is a true prophet, and a false spirit is a false prophet. How do you determine whether a spirit or prophet is of truth from God. He says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus is the Christ is of God. And Islam is the only non-Christian faith that makes it an article of faith for scholars to believe in Jesus. So if you use that angle and analogy, we could argue that from the perspective of the New Testament, that comforter, that spirit of truth, you are having six masculine pronouns in a single verse, it ill befits a spirit. It refers to someone that is to come after Christ. And so I'd leave you with that. I know you may have a no, response to that. No, I'm jumping back in. Because you jumped on. I'm jumping in. Okay. But when, when he mentions the, the comforter, the spirit of truth, John 14, very quickly. Yeah. He, he says, the comforter is the Holy Spirit. It, it does define that. I'll but, pray the Father. He'll give you another comforter. May I abide with you forever. So he's still here. Yeah. And that wouldn't fit Muhammad. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth them not. They saw Muhammad, but you can't see the spirit of truth. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Muhammad cannot live within, but the Holy Spirit could. The thing in 1 John chapter 4, believe not every spirit, try the spirits. There's many false prophets. Many false prophets. It's because the false prophets have an unclean spirit in them. It's, it's, they... The reason they're preaching falsehood is because they've been led wrong but by But John, John does use spiritual prophet. But we can debate that in... in we'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to take this liberty. I'm not going to preach. I want to thank Pastor Mike, since you've been our guest. I want to thank all of you for attending. I think um, it's important we have sessions like this. We're going to certainly reciprocate. I'm going to visit your congregation soon. We'd love to see you all here. As you can see, we, you are our friends. We are brothers and sisters. Not necessarily in faith, but in humanity. And, and as part of our tradition, um, um, I did, uh, Pastor Mike already saw his gift, but I want to take this opportunity to give him this beautifully bound Quran. I'm not going to tell you the price of it, but it's probably one of the best translations you will find by Muhammad Asad, an Austrian-German Jew, formerly called Leopold Weiss. Uh, he wrote for the Frankfurter Zeitung in 1921. He died in 1992. It's a gift. I don't even own a copy uh, that is bound in this particular fashion, but I'm going to hand you a copy. Uh, Pastor Mike, thank you very, very much. It's always a pleasure to see you and we really appreciate your chatting so far. So everybody, can you give the two speakers a hand?